Good morning Year 3 and Year 4. It's a delight to be able to meet with you again this morning. And we're continuing our series looking at um, stories that Jesus told. And I just want to clarify that word stories that Jesus told or um, events that occurred in the Bible. When we say I'm going to share with you a story from the Bible, what we actually mean is that this is an event that really happened. So today's story actually occurred. It's a conversation between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus asks him a really important question. One that I would hope that you will be asking as well. Nicodemus asks Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Now, Nicodemus was a teacher of the law. So it's kind of a bit strange that he wanted to ask Jesus this question. A teacher of the law means that he was very kind of high up in the church. He knew lots about the Bible or the Old Testament at that time. He knew lots about who God was, who God is, and what God had done in the past. But he still had this question. What must I do to be saved? So he comes and asks Jesus. He recognises that Jesus seems to have this understanding about God that he doesn't yet have. And so he comes to Jesus with this question. I'm going to show you a video that captures this event. Remember, it's not just a story. It's a real event. It's a real conversation. It really occurred. So this first video is a replay of that real conversation. I want you to listen carefully. I want you to pay attention because I've got a question for you when we finish this video. All right, listen in carefully. While Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in him as they saw the miracles he performed. But Jesus did not trust himself to them because he knew them all. There was no need for anyone to tell him about them because he himself knew what was in their hearts. There was a Jewish leader named Nicodemus who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. One night, he went to Jesus. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent by God. No one could perform the miracles you are doing unless God were with him. I am telling you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. How can a grown man be born again? He certainly cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time. I am telling you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. A person is born physically of human parents, but is born spiritually of the spirit. <laughs> Do not be surprised because I tell you that you must all be born again. The wind blows wherever it wishes. You hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. It is like that with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? You are a great teacher in Israel, and you don't know this. I am telling you the truth. We speak of what we know and report what we have seen. Yet none of you is willing to accept our message. You do not believe me when I tell you about the things of this world. How will you ever believe me then when I tell you about the things of heaven? And no one has ever gone up to heaven except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, 
in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged. But those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. All right. There, you may have noticed Nicodemus's confusion in Jesus' response. Because Jesus said some pretty challenging things, some things that are a bit weird. Remember, Nicodemus's question is, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus' answer is, you must be born again. And you can kind of see Nicodemus going, what do you mean born again? I can't go back into my mother's womb and be born again. And then Jesus starts using a language that we might find a little bit confusing. He says, you need to be born of the Spirit. I've got to admit, when I was about your age and I heard this story, this event, this conversation, that phrase, born of the Spirit, really challenged me. I, I wasn't really sure what it meant. So I want, to, I want you to think for a moment. Jesus talks about being born again. What does he mean, born again? Is it possible to be born again? I want you to think of some, some times when life gets a second chance. And some examples when life gets a second chance, or a second birth, or a second restart. For example, butterflies. They start out as caterpillars. They're born into this world as little caterpillars. Make a cocoon after eating a whole lot of food. You remember the story of the hungry caterpillar. Make a cocoon and then are born again as a butterfly. Can you think of some other natural examples? And I want you to put these in the chat. So we might pause for a moment on saying hi to everybody. And I want you to respond to that question. Can you think of some other examples when life gets a second chance? I'm going to give you two minutes to put something in the chat. Okay, thank you for your responses in the chat. I could see you thinking because for a while the chat just went a little bit quiet. So I'm glad to see you thinking about the question that I asked. And it's a tricky one. Um, Harrison said in the chat, it, that's a really hard question. And it is. No wonder Nicodemus was confused. But a few of you gave a, a couple of good examples. Some of you talked about moths. They get a second chance at life. 
Um, some of you talked about the silkworms. Um, some of you talked about how God gives us a second chance. When we, um, when we sin, God forgives us and he gives us a second chance. So thank you so much for sharing your responses. I want you to stop now sharing in the chat and pay attention to this next video. I don't know if you recall, but in that conversation that Nicodemus had with Jesus, to help Nicodemus understand what it meant to be born again, Jesus actually points to an event from the Old Testament. Another story, or should I say, another event, something that actually occurred in the Old Testament, just to help Nicodemus understand what he meant when he used the phrase born again. And so I'm going to show you another video, a video that retells the story or the event that actually occurred way back in the Old Testament. And this is the story that Jesus pointed Nicodemus to, to help him understand what it means to be born again. Please pay attention to this story too, because I've got another question for you. It's time for a Bible story. This story begins with a group of people called the Israelites. Ah, uh, I've heard of those guys before. They were the ones that were like slaves in Egypt. And then that one guy was like, let them go. And then the other guy was like, no way, bro. And then God was like, fine then. Do the big splash wave, son. Judged and rescued. Eh, close enough. The Israelites were rescued by God from being slaves in Egypt. And after that, they started traveling across the desert to a place God promised them called the Promised Land. Mm, that's a good name. Sounds promising. It was. Their future home was a paradise that God wanted them to live and thrive in, but first, they'd have to get there. What are you talking about? It's like right next to where they came from. Look at that. What's the problem? I can make that trip in like, what, 45 minutes? No problem. Give me a helicopter, maybe a dune buggy, throw in a movie, get some big gulps. No problem. Well, sure, but this was like thousands of years ago, remember? Ah, uh, right, yes. I forget that a lot, huh? Literally every time. Shrug emoji. So what'd they do, like just hoof it across the desert? Actually, yeah. They set out traveling toward the promised land, but traveling on foot like that across the desert was not easy. Yeah, no kidding, man. I can barely make it across the driveway when I gotta take the trash out. Well, imagine that, but like a million times farther and in the desert. And instead of just trash, it was like everything you own. Yowza. Okay, so what happened next? As they traveled across the desert, God totally took care of them. He provided water when they needed it, food when they were hungry, and protected them from enemies as they went along. That is awesome. Okay, all right. So they made it across. Case closed. End of story. Roll credits. Not so fast. The Israelites had one big problem, complaining. Okay, hold on. Wait, what? They got pretty ungrateful for everything they'd been given and had some pretty rotten attitudes toward God. Hold the phone. Let me get this straight. Okay, so God rescued them from slavery. Yes. Gives them like food and water in the desert. Yeah. Protects them from bad guys. Yep. And they're a bunch of grumbly grumbles about it. What a bunch of lamos. Yeah, it definitely wasn't great. They sinned against God and basically turned on him. And because of that, they weren't protected like they used to be. In fact, a bunch of snakes in the desert started biting them. Whoa, yikes. Desert snakes? Oh man, those are like the second worst kind. Wait, what's the first? Space snakes. Ah, of course. Tons of them were bitten by these snakes, and a bunch of them even died. Oh man, that's rough. So like, what happened? Well, God told Moses, their leader, to make a bronze serpent on a staff and put it in the ground where everyone could see it. Okay, like a snake scarecrow? No, not like that. It was like a symbol. God instructed anyone that was bitten by a snake to look at the staff and they would live. Okay, cool, all right, and did it work? Of course. God was reminding them to look to him whenever they got into trouble, instead of just complaining about it and hardening their hearts. And even though we're not in the same kind of situation today, that principle still applies. God has done so much for us when we didn't even deserve any of it. So all we can do is be grateful and continually say, thank you. Ah, oh, you're welcome, man. Wait, no, I was saying, like, thank you to God. Oh, right, 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 my bad, my bad, just a reflex. Hashtag manners. No worries. So remember, God has done so much for us, and we always want to make sure that we stay grateful and thankful for how much he loves us. And also, watch out for space snakes. Yes, also that. The end.
Okay. Well, the question that I have for you now is I wonder if you can see any similarities between this event that occurred in the Old Testament and um, what Jesus has done for us. Let me ask that again. You can use the chat. I wonder if you can see any similarities between this event that occurred for the people in the Old Testament and what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Take a little moment to think. It's another hard question, but I think you guys are up for it. Take a little moment to think and use the chat. Any similarities between what happened with the snake on the pole that people had to look to and what Jesus has done on the cross? All right, use the live chat and we'll touch base in a moment. One kid wrote, yeah, space snakes. <laughs> We start from the camera. Yeah. Okay. okay, I think we're ready. All right, some really terrific answers in the live chat. And it's, it's not an easy question, so you guys have done a great job. I just want to share with you, if you haven't already seen it, Theodore Thompson's answer. He said, it's a bit like how we can look at, um, how we can look at Jesus when he also died on the cross. So I think what, what Theodore's um, saying is the similarity is that the, the people in the desert had to look up at the snake to be saved from the snake bites. And we, to be saved now, need to look up at Jesus on the cross. Great answer, Theodore. Um, also, Ariel Caden said, uh, and I've got to try and find it now. You guys just keep entering so many good answers into this spot. Ariel Caden said they were both dying for us. That's right. The bronze snake was put there in the place of the people's sin. Jesus was put on the cross in the place of our sin. And, um, and then Harrison Koran um, was talking about the symbolism of the snake on the cross being held up on the pole is like Jesus being held up as he died on the cross for us. Some really great responses. Thank you so much. Just put a pause now and listen to this final bit that I'm going to share with you. The people of Israel. Let's think about some more similarities between those stories. The people of Israel complained against God. He'd saved them from Egypt. He'd brought them out of Egypt and rescued them. And now, they were complaining against him. They were sinning against God. And really what that meant is that they should have, they deserved to die. They deserved to die in the desert. Jesus had brought them out of slavery and yet they were, God had brought them out of slavery and yet they were complaining against him. What they deserved was death. Hey, we're no different. We have sinned against God in lots of ways. Maybe we don't complain against God. I, I know I find myself often complaining against God. Maybe that's not the things that you gravitate towards. But in all sorts of ways, we sin against the God who made us and created us and wants to have a relationship with us. And for that, we deserve to be separated from him forever. Okay. The other similarity 
is in the solution that's provided. So the people of Israel had a problem. They deserved death, but God didn't give them death. He didn't give them what they deserved. He gave them a second chance. And that second chance came in the form of a snake on a pole that they had to look up to. And when they did that, they would receive a second chance at life. They wouldn't die from the snake bite. And then let's look at us. We deserve to be separated from God for all that we've done. But yet that's not what God wants for us. And so he provides again, he provides a solution in his perfect son, Jesus Christ, his perfect son. He gives us a chance to have a second go at life, to have real life by looking upon the cross we get to have a chance at second life by, look, by taking what Jesus has done for us on the cross. In place of our sin, we get to have a second chance of life at life. Let's go back to that conversation between Nicodemus. Nicodemus was thrown by, God's, by Jesus' comment, you must be born again. And what we find at the end of that conversation that occurred between Nicodemus and Jesus is a really famous verse that you will all know, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him, that means whoever believes in him, will find eternal life. What does it mean to be born again? It means that if you believe in Jesus, if you look up like the people of Israel looked towards the snake. If you look towards Jesus and say, you are my salvation. I need you, Jesus. I've got a problem and you are the only solution. Then you too can have eternal life. So it's a wonderful answer that Jesus gives to Nicodemus. Nicodemus says, what must I do to be saved? And really Jesus says, what you need to do to be saved is to um, be ready for me to take your place. On the cross. Wonderful, we have a wonderful, wonderful God and a wonderful, wonderful Saviour. And I hope that you now have a little bit more clarity on that conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus because it's a really important conversation. I hope it's a question you're asking and I hope that today as we've shared these two events in the Bible that it's given you some things to think about. I wonder if you've ever asked that question, what must I do to be saved? Maybe you've already taken that step. You've already looked to Jesus for your salvation. That's really wonderful if you have. And if you haven't thought about that question before, and maybe if you haven't taken that step to look to Jesus to be saved, I encourage you to just think more about that. Maybe ask your teachers some questions or your mums and dads. Or you could even write me a question, write me an email. I'd love to talk to you more about that. I hope you really enjoy your day. I'm going to pray for you as we finish. So join me in praying. Dear God, I thank you for um, your word, the Bible, so that we can remember all these true events that have occurred. These conversations that help us to understand more about you. Thank you that you provided the solution. We can't provide a solution to our own problem, but you provided the solution. And we thank you that all we have to do is believe in you. It's so simple. Lord, I pray for these students that they will be thinking about this conversation for many years to come. And I pray particularly that they'll hold on to that really important message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for today. In your son's name, amen. I'll see you next week, year three and year four. Bye.